second course, looking at the series of disciplines. And um, I know what you're all thinking. I'm surprised nobody said it yet. But you're all thinking, happy Cranmer Day. And I say thank you so much. Today the church remembers Thomas Cranmer. And for those of you who don't know, he's the guy who basically helped kickstart the Church of England, as in the church speaking in English. He wrote the Book of Common Prayer, an absolute classic, loved by those over here, those over here, maybe. Thank you. But in all seriousness, he, we remember him today because this is the day when he died. He was actually burnt at the stake because um, he felt like that he was doing so well. And then Henry VIII died and he was thrown in prison. And then the Catholic royal family came forward and they decided we're going to burn you at the stake because you are a crook, basically. You've translated it from Latin to English. How dare you? And just as he was about to die... Apparently, he said, burn my hand first because it betrayed me. Because he was forced to write letters of apology to the Pope. And I just love the passion of wanting people to be able to pray and worship in ways that we all understand. So I'm going to ask you all to stand now together. Just please stand up. Don't worry. And then we're all going to stand on one leg. <laughs> I'll just like to see if you do it. Sorry, I shouldn't do that. Please don't do that. And I just thought, we're going to hold a space of silence, and we're going to then pray out loud all together. And what we're going to do is we are just going to speak as if we are talking to Jesus right in front of us. And I literally mean that. So if you've had a terrible week so far, and it's only Monday, I want you to lay it down in front of him. Trust me, last week I was already there. But you can lay it down in front of him. If it's just words of praise, if it's something in the Psalms you've read, something in Scripture you've read, I just want you to declare it because part of the freedom we have is that we can speak to God in a relationship, a God who hears us, a God who loves us, and a God where we can come speaking how we would choose to, the language that we all understand together. So I'm going to do a countdown and then just pray out loud together. Whatever's on your heart, Jesus is with us. His presence is among us. Let's go. Lord Jesus. Eternal God, give us insight to discern your will for us, to give up what harms us and to seek the perfection we are promised in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So, please be seated. We're going to start with a quick kind of catch up for those of you who weren't here last week and just for the opportunity to feed back into your groups about what we spoke about last week, about anything you may have put into practice, things that you feel are going really well, maybe things that you've basically just fallen flat on your face uh, trying to do it. So last week we were looking at meditation, we were looking at prayer, we were looking at fasting and we were looking at study. So I just want to give you a few minutes now just to share. If you remember last week, we had the wheel where you could color in and see where you had time available to put these disciplines in place. And the week laid out to see where there may be space as well. So yeah, just chatting your groups. How have you been getting on? Where have you got up to? Are there things you're succeeding in and other things you are struggling with? Go.
Okay, that's great. Thank you so much for... Do you, you need 10 more seconds? I've just shown favoritism. I was calling time and they pleaded. And because I'm such a kind, humble, generous person, I couldn't resist. So th that's great. So that is what we were looking at last week. It doesn't mean we forget about it. Forget about it. It means that that is the inward disciplines. Next week, we're going to be looking at corporate disciplines, which means what do we do together, which includes, and it's going to be a fun one, confession, worship, guidance, and celebration. But tonight, we are going to be looking at outward disciplines. So that means the things that we do outwardly. I know it sounds obvious, but the first one feels like a bit of a trap, but it isn't, I promise. It all comes together. The four for tonight are going to be simplicity, solitude, submission, and service. So, ooh. They sound scarier than they are, but they're also rock hard to put into practice. So that's why we do courses like this. So the first one, simplicity. Um, again, we're going to be using Richard Foster's book. He says that it's an inward reality that results in an outward lifestyle. So it's the inward reality, the way we think, the way we make decisions, the way we conduct ourselves. That then is reflected outwardly in our lifestyle. Simplicity sounds like, uh, well, quite simple, pardon the pun, it was terrible. But one of, the pieces, one of the parts of Scripture that he references is from Exodus chapter 10, verse, verse 17. And you'll recognize Exodus chapter 10 because it happens to be the Ten Commandments. But the Tenth Commandment, can anyone remember what it is? The Tenth one, no, that's the first one. Kind of, yeah. You will have no other gods above me. But yeah, 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 that's good. That's not it. Sorry. The tenth one, the last one, the King James ver Version is hilarious. Pardon? Thank you so much, yeah. So it's about coveting. It's about wanting other people's things. It says this, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife or male or female slaves or oxes or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And he argues that this 10th commandment is against the lust that we might have to have things, to have everything we want. This idea that we are in control, that we can take whatever we want. The King James Version does say, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's ass. But um, that's irrelevant. It's just funny. Sorry. And then the response building on top of this, the 10th commandment, is found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 to 33. And what Richard Foster argues is that sometimes we can dance around simplicity, economics, you know, what does Jesus say about money? What does Jesus say about how we look, how we should conduct ourselves? But he says this is kind of the smackdown of this is what Jesus says. This is how we are to conduct our lives. He says this, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, 
you of little faith. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. It's that last line that uh, Foster claims is our key. That is what we look at. Because it's not something we try and chase after. It's something that happens through the way we live, the way we have priority of the kingdom of God over all those other things. There's a quote here uh, from Soren Kierkegaard, and it says this, Seek ye first God's kingdom and his righteousness. What does this mean? What have I to do? Or what sort of effort is it that can be said to seek or pursue the kingdom of God? Shall I try to get a job suitable to my talents and powers in order thereby to exert an influence? No. You shall first seek God's kingdom. Shall I then give all my fortune to the poor? No. You shall first seek God's kingdom. Shall I then go out to proclaim, in, proclaim his teaching into the world? No. You shall first seek God's kingdom. But then in a certain sense... It is nothing I shall do. Yes, certainly, in a certain sense, it is nothing. Become, become nothing before God. Learn to keep silent. And he says, in this silence is the beginning, which is first to seek God's kingdom. So if you didn't pick it up, it's about pursuing the kingdom of God. It's seeking the kingdom of God. What's really interesting in the book as well, and I do recommend you all get a copy and read it, is he talks about the danger of, of prescribing what simplicity looks like. Because otherwise, it becomes legalistic. If I say to you, you should all only have three jumpers from now on, there may be a situation where you might need a fourth, but then we all turn on you like a pack of wolves because, I know I've only got three, but that's because I'm so holy. Um, because it becomes legalistic. And he gives the example from uh, one of the epistles of Peter where he talks about not having jewelry and braiding your hair. And he was speaking to a situation, a time back then. It's not for now. What I love and what I find scary about that challenge is that the ball is in our court. It's between us looking at the other disciplines. When we draw close to God, what is it that we actually need? What is it that we don't need? One of the challenges he says is, what do you find addictive? What are the things that you feel like you just can't do without, but if they were gone, you'd still be alive? There's a great saying, Jesus said it, and the Jesuits cut it down because they're cool. Uh, it's St. Ignatius of Loyola, in case you wonder if he's going to get a mention. Bingo yet? Nope, that's fine. And he says, if you have two coats, one belongs to your brother. And... Um, I just love that. I love, again, it's that simplicity of being able to understand the words, the idea of how you live, but the challenge is putting it into action. I don't have a copy with me. I brought a couple of books tonight to kind of just flag ones that I found helpful. But um, if you kind of want to look into this outward disciplines, I would recommend John Mark Comer's book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, because I feel like he hits it absolutely on the head about not making sure it gets legalistic, about setting what counts as being a Christian simple way of living. Instead, he brings in different factors. He talks about if you are a parent, if you're a single person, if you're a student, if you've got a full-time job. I feel like he tries to address all the different um, scenarios, if you like, all the different lifestyles. So I've got a few questions for you to discuss around simplicity. If you'd just like to pop them up for me, Kath, that'd be superb. So these are what I want you to talk about. What comes to mind when you think about simplicity? Then how does it make you feel? Have you ever tried, have you ever tried it, sorry, any like any practices of simplicity? If so, how did it go? And are there any areas you want to work on? So please discuss there your four questions to get stuck into. Five if you count the third one being two. Enjoy.
That's great. So um, hopefully you've been able to share some ideas what simplicity looks like. In this group over here, we were just talking about how you put them into action. And I um, hope you don't mind me, I just want to share a couple. And it was uh, it's things like around how you uh, basically have your attitude towards things like when you get in the car, I was saying to them that quite a while ago there was a push to rename glove boxes foam boxes, but it didn't really take off because everyone thinks of foam boxes on the street. But the idea is when you get into a car, before you start the engine, you put your mobile phone into the glove box. And uh, I, I'll be honest, I, that, that makes me feel a bit weird as well. I haven't actually adopted it. But it's a good idea because what you're saying is that when you're driving somewhere, that is what you are doing. You are simply driving there. You don't need to be seeing who's messaging you. You don't need to be able to see, um, even if you're not going to read the text, who sent it. And we've just got this kind of need, as, as you were saying, like be in the loop, know what's going on all the time. Um, so I thought it was just a really good one. I'm sure you've all got other ones as well. I got carried away in that one, so I apologize. The next one that also links uh, with simplicity as well in some way is solitude. So I know somebody was asking about what solitude is before. And um, solitude is a fascinating one, really, because I think it can sound quite scary. It can sound quite lonely. But luckily, I've got a superb quote by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he says this, let him who cannot be alone be a w beware of community. Let him who is not in community beware of being alone. Each by itself has profound pitfalls and perils. One who wants fellowship without solitude plunges into the void of words and feelings. And one who seeks solitude without fellowship perishes in the abyss of vanity self-infatuation and despair. In his defense, I think he was in a concentration camp when he was writing this. So at least we've still got some positives. We have a fear of being alone. And there is a fear of being alone um, where even if you're in the house, maybe you feel like you've got to have music on, you've got to have the radio on. But actually, we read that Jesus is constantly going off to deserted places to pray. And again, to quote John Mark Comer, when we're looking at these things, the question that I get convicted with is, do I think I'm better than Jesus? Do I think, well, Jesus, who's the Son of God, who is also God incarnate, needed to be on his own praying, but luckily Ben Brady doesn't. Hopefully, you know, that isn't going to rub off on all you lot, and I want to try harder. Solitude is intentionally being aware from everyone else and being with God, spending time with God. I love this idea of, and this is where it links to simplicity, is doing something for the sake of doing something. That's it. Going for a walk because you want to go for a walk. It's not a walk to the shops. It's not a walk around to your mates. It's just a walk I mean, we live in a beautiful city. We're surrounded by parks as well. We've got the common, wherever you are. There's beautiful things just to walk around, doing it for the sake of just doing something alone, taking that time. There's a couple of books I'd recommend if you're interested in um, this spending time alone in quiet. The first one is out of print, but you can pick it up dirt cheap. And it's called Sedana, A Way to God. And um, I can't remember who it was written by, but you can have a look afterwards. And this is a book written by a Christian who went and spent time in India to look at how they pray contempl contemplatively, sorry, in, uh, especially in Buddhist temples. How do you sit? What is your posture? How do you focus on your breathing? What is your body doing when you simply sit on your own and relax and pray to have an encounter with God on your own? It's, it's actually really good. It's Anthony DeMello, sorry. I knew it was on there. And guess what? He's a Jesuit. Couldn't help myself, sorry. Anthony DeMello. I'm going to have them here for you to have a look at if you want. And, and it has really practical tips of what to do. And I just wanted to quickly share with you. I know we're running over a bit, but it'll be fine. One of them was where you simply sat there with a, uh, with a timer, with a clock. I did it on my watch because it's fancy. And for 10 minutes, you sit there and you simply just be. 
you have your feet planted on the floor, you close your eyes, you have your hands on your lap or somewhere where they're not going to flip around. And it just said simply, focus on your top lip and see how long it takes for you basically to be able to feel your breath on your top lip. And it absolutely blew my mind. Because we can feel it, but we forget we can feel it. There's loads of things that our body are going through right now that we don't basically take into account. And what I suddenly realized, I'm going to sound like a weirdo even more so, is I realized that I found my t-shirt quite tickly. And I'm really ticklish. And I didn't whip my clothes off. Don't worry, it didn't get like sexy or anything on my own. Oh, it's on YouTube. It's all right. It didn't. Just saying. But it's just that awareness of yourself and then being aware that God's presence is around us. But to do that, we have to take ourselves out of the noise. It's not taking ourselves away from people like Bonhoeffer was saying, but it's about taking ourselves away from the noise. There's one way that I think we could try, if you want to do a bit of an experiment on yourself, which I'm a fan of doing, is... Um, Limit your time on social media, for example, or limit your time on reading news on your phone. Phones are amazing. I love the technology. They're superb. But we are constantly tapped into a never-ending stream of bright colors that want our attention. And I think that social media is just as noisy as being in a crowded room. There's always something going on, always something trying to grab your attention. And especially if you don't pay for it, you're the product. That's what they want. They want your time. So that's one practical way to try that if you want to. But I think this is the only one that comes with a bit of a warning. And that is that when you do spend time on your own, God will speak to you. But also things can come up. And uh, St. John of the Cross uh, famously wrote uh, a collection called The Dark Night of the Soul. And that's where he speaks about what it's like to feel completely abandoned. He warns that sometimes you can almost have feelings of depression when you spend times in solitude where it's just you and God. And it's not because you sat on your own in a room, but it's that vulnerability. It's the fact that you are opening your whole self up to God who is infinite. There's another book that's simply called Prayer. And um, it's written by a Greek Orthodox priest. And he talks about the holiness of prayer, again, that we can forget. He says that actually when we pray, we're almost playing with fire. And if you're not careful when you're using fire, you're going to get burned. It is an intense experience. And like all the other disciplines, solitude is something we step into. It's something we choose to do. It's something that we may have to remind ourselves, remind each others, each other of what we need to do. St. Ignatius, too, he spoke about taking time to prepare before our time with God. And one of his recommendations when he's leading, the called spiritual exercises, um, I haven't read it fully yet, but it'll be amazing. I just know it will be. He talks about how do we prepare ourselves before we enter into prayer. And his top tip, which I've nicked because it's dead easy, is wherever you're about to pray, whether it's at the front, when you see me with my eyes shut, sometimes I'm doing this, when I'm at home and I've got a nice chair I pray in sometimes, you stand next to it and you just recite the Lord's Prayer in your head. So you're kind of giving yourself a moment to still yourself, to say a prayer, and then you enter into the prayer yourself. So I recommend that to you. And again, this solitude does line up with simplicity in many ways. It does require planning. It does require making space. It requires you stepping into it. Sadly, solitude isn't something where if you're feeling like a bit of a Billy Nomad, you can be like, well, this kind of counts like solitude. It, it isn't. It's about the intention. You can turn it around. It's not making the worst, uh, the best of a bad situation. It's about intentionally saying, I'm going to sit still for three minutes. Start with three minutes, five minutes, and it will get longer. I've got one friend who basically, well, I love him dearly, but 
you can't shut him up. But he went through a phase where he absolutely loved praying in silence. And we could not believe it. And when I was asking him, tell me your secrets, he recommended this book to me. And it's by Rome Williams. So anything he writes is either brilliant or I don't understand it. Um, if it's thin, they're the ones I like. Uh, <laughs> the thick ones are a nightmare. And this one is called Silence and Honey Cakes. And it's the wisdom of the desert. So it's about all the people, that they're called the Desert Fathers, who lived in isolation and how they spent their time in solitude. It was common practice, believe it or not, for them to recite all of the Psalms in a day. They'll just balance on a beam somewhere in the middle of a desert and just be reciting all the Psalms, just on that quest to draw closer to God. So the next load of questions for you to look at are very similar to the first ones, but I just thought they were quite pressing. The first one is, what comes to mind when you think about solitude? How does it make you feel? Have you ever tried it? I should have changed that one. If so, how did it go? Are there any areas you want to work on? And that just means in your life, in your timetable, in your framework. So, um, yeah, chat in your groups. What does it look like? Solitude.
Dearly beloved, we are gathered. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you so much. We're going to come on now to the, the last two. And these ones do actually fit together beautifully. And um, they're given the imagery of the cross and the towel. The first one is submission, the idea of the cross. From what we remember Jesus doing there. It's quite a big one. If you're not sure about it, talk to me and go on the Alpha course. And Jim and others around us. The opening line for the discipline of submission is from Martin Luther, and it says this. A Christian man is the most free lord of all and subject to none. A Christian man is the most dutiful servant of all and subject to everyone. So he's talking about the servanthood that we see in Christ, how we are to serve others. Jesus tells that we should love others as ourselves. Foster's quite clear to point out that self-denial, submission, if you will, is not self-hatred or self-contempt. It's not being horrendous to yourself. It's not going too far. We were kind of saying over there, it's not about being miserable, these disciplines. But especially submission, the freedom that comes with it, he says it's a freedom of not always having to be right. And more importantly, maybe more than ever, maybe it's always been the same, our happiness is not dependent on getting what we want. So our happiness isn't just dependent on getting what we want. This idea of filling this, this void with crap, with stuff that we're being told is what we need. Stuff that will make us happy. More importantly, he says that we are not to deny ourselves or others from the law of love. From the fundamental teachings of Jesus to love others as yourself. We are not to deny others. The thing is, submission flows into service. This is again an inward reality that results in an outward lifestyle. It's the attitude of submission. How do we approach other people? How do we speak to them? How do we treat them? How do we value them as other children of God? And he says this, that the thing with submission is that the way we see it in action, the way we see it in the outward lifestyle, comes under service, which is our fourth one. And that is the towel. That is when we remember Jesus washing the disciples' feet. It's one of my favorite parts, actually, in John's Gospel, where Peter flips between, Lord, you cannot wash my feet. Do you not realize who you are? And Jesus says, Peter, again, you've misunderstood what's going on. I need to wash your feet. I'm the servant king. And Jesus goes, well, in that case, wash me from head to foot. And Jesus says, someone who's had a bath doesn't need washing from head to foot. I'm just going to wash your feet. Now, not only was Jesus a bit sassy, he was still the servant king who we are called to follow. The thing is with service, and this is one of the challenges I found, is that you grow in it. Because the fruit of service is humility. It's not putting ourselves above others. He well, Foster, not Jesus. Well, Jesus would do as well because he's very smart. Foster warns us that if you try and pursue humility, if you just try and pursue serving, you can find yourselves distancing yourself from others. What it reminds me of is in Friends where Joey and Phoebe bet that they can't do a truly selfless act. And that's true, because as soon as you're trying to prove that you can do a selfless act, it's no longer selfless. The ongoing discipline, that ongoing moving forwards, that's how you pursue it, is through service. So submission and service, as I said, comes down to this image of the cross and the towel, both of which belong to Jesus. There's a great quote here, and it says this. Learn the lesson that if you are to do the work of a prophet, 
What you need is not a scepter, but a hoe or a hoe. Sorry, Josh. It's this idea of serving others isn't about putting ourselves above them. Oh, isn't it wonderful? Look at me caring for others, serving others. But it's actually getting stuck in. Pope Francis, the current Pope uh, in the Vatican, um, when it came to Monday, Thursday, traditionally, the Pope would have cardinals selected and they would have this beautiful ceremony where the Pope would wash the feet of the cardinals. And the cardinals are like high-ranking clergy, and that's fine. But Pope Francis came along and said, we're not doing that anymore. What we're going to do is we're going to go, <laughs> we're gonna go to basically the local prison and uh, I'm going to wash all their feet. And he did. And it's something he's continued to do. Because he believes that it's not about having basically the show and saying, look at how fab it is. But it's actually being serious. I had a fairly terrible time in Ashton um, now and again. I had perks as well. But Monday, Thursday was always one of the most awkward services we did because we insisted on washing the feet. And the thing is, it wasn't awkward so much for the people who didn't want to take their shoes and socks off. I, you know, I get that. But it was the fact that I remember explicitly washing the feet of this old lady who was so full of wisdom. She was just a lovely person. And she just kept saying to me, because she came up, she said, I can't believe he's making you wash my feet. I can't believe he's making you wash my feet. And that's when I realized, who the hell does she think I am? And even worse... How am I presenting myself in church for her to be mortified that I'm washing her feet? And that's the challenge, I think, that comes with service. We all know the saying about those who want to follow me must carry their cross. There's loads to unpack in that. And actually, I think there can be an element where we enjoy that. It comes to Lent, the self-denial, but we know it's going to end. And taking it seriously... But I think the big challenge is the service. It's the towel. And this is where it links in beautifully with the kind of all the other ones we've looked at tonight. The simplicity, the solitude, not being scared of being wrong. Not being scared of admitting when you don't know something. Because actually you're there to serve others. We're actually all there to serve each other. So how you do that, again, this is where these four, I think, are the most challenging. It is between you and God. We have a choice of making the difference between choosing to serve and being somebody's slave. I've heard this before. I've been asked it by younger children as well when I go into schools. Um, there's a fear that we'll be taken advantage of. So I'm telling you to serve others. And straight away, it's like, oh, but they'll take advantage. You know, if I make one person a cup of tea, they're all going to want a cup of tea. You know, it's one of those things. That's just my family's household. No one dares move. But actually, we still have a choice. We are not called to be doormats. We are not to hide behind this fear. And we're also not to hide behind, actually, our own self-importance. Well, I can't. I, I can't possibly put a chair away because, well, I'm the associate vicar. Goodness me. Well, I can't possibly, I do. Yeah, but it's those things, and that's what I find scary. I've got another quote written down. I forgot which one it was. It'll be a banger. It says this. The risen Christ beckons us to the ministry of the towel. And it says this, perhaps you would like to begin by experimenting with a prayer. And you begin the day by saying this. Again, this is careful what you pray for, careful what you ask for. It says, Lord Jesus, I would so appreciate it if you would bring me someone today whom I can serve. The risen Christ beckons us to the ministry of the towel. Begin the day by saying, Lord Jesus, I would so appreciate it if you would bring me someone today whom I can serve. 
It's not about ticking boxes. It's about showing the love of God to each other, to the stranger, to the friend, to the family, to the person you just can't stand. Because that is what we are called to do. So I'm going to give you five, well, just under five minutes because we've gone over, to look at the last questions again. Uh, slide three, please. It says, what comes to mind when you think about submission and service? I was also curious if having the phrase, the cross and the towel, does that help change your perspective? And again, how does it make you feel? Have you ever tried any? If so, how did it go? Are there any areas you want to work on? So I'll just give you a few moments to discuss those ones and we'll come back together for prayer.
Okay, great stuff. I want, just want to invite you all to stand as we're coming towards the end now. Um, there's been some great conversations. I've just he- overheard rumours. Best group tonight over here. Thank you so much for uh, having me. We're just going to hold the quiet for for a minute or so, and then um, we're, we're just going to share with each other maybe something that maybe you feel challenged by. So this next time now, uh, I just invite you to close your eyes and um, just become aware of your breathing. Just become aware that um, you're feeling tired, you're sleepy, but still God's presence is around us. And in the quiet now, so Lord Jesus, we just ask that you bring to mind those things that maybe we're challenged with, the things we want to try. So just invite you in pairs or in threes to people around you just to turn and just pray for each other. It might be for things that have come up tonight, things that have been in the other courses of areas you want to try and pursue in your disciplines. So please turn around, pray. Great. So, Heavenly Father, we bring before you all the prayers that are coming up to you. We thank you that we can come together to pursue you, to know you more. I pray that you bless our week. I pray that we uh, just draw closer to you in whichever way uh, we want to focus on. We thank you that you long for us to be closer to you. And we thank you that you are a Heavenly Father with arms wide open, waiting to embrace us. So, bless us as we leave this place and bless us in our conversations. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Um, Amen. Thank you all so much for coming. Feel free to pop your chair up there as a practice of uh, service and take your cups to the back. If you remember, he's watching and if you want a gold brick, that doesn't happen. See you all next week.